So alrighty, I think we will get started this evening. Welcome everyone. This is our September members meeting. Believe it or not, September uh, is here already. And I'm Nancy Howell, one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. And I am pleased to have the participants that are have joined in. Um, I hope everybody has had a great weekend and looking forward to a, a lovely fall. I don't know what COVID is going to be doing and I don't know if anybody really knows what's going to happen. So I just wish everybody will stay safe and, uh, and just have a, a, a great, great fall. And join us for our meetings and presentations and some of the other things that Western Cuyahoga Audubon has to offer. Um, we have a few announcements uh, and that'll take us up to about 8 o'clock when our speaker will join us and we will have a fabulous program. So again, Nancy Howell, member of the board, and again, welcome everyone. Um, we have a couple of things that, that I wanted to announce. Uh, first of all, we have uh, our membership is due. Uh, our membership year runs from September 1st through August 31st. And, uh, you know, either you can renew or invite somebody to join. We'd love to have some new members as well. Um, and maybe some of your friends or join at a slightly different level, maybe as a family level. Our memberships begin at $20 for student or limited income and all the way up to $750 for benefactors. Um, but most people are joined at either the individual or the family uh, levels. And you can either pay through PayPal or send a check and the information is on the link there at the Western Cuyahoga Audubon website. We've got a couple of other announcements dealing with some events coming up. The Council of Ohio Audubon Chapters, or COAC, of which Western Cuyahoga Audubon is a member, will be having its fall gathering on Saturday, October 16th. And right now, uh, it's at, scheduled to be at the Grange Insurance Audubon Center in Columbus uh, and the gathering runs from 9 in the morning to 3.30 in the afternoon on that Saturday. Uh, there are some Friday evening events, but again with COVID hanging around, uh, things are still a little nebulous as far as if it's going to be an in-person gathering, right now it is. Um, we're just still waiting to see because, uh, you know, October is eh, a couple weeks away. And um, so will it be an in-person gathering? Will it be a hybrid of Zoom and in-person? Will it be a total Zoom meeting uh, or gathering? Um, stay tuned. But please, if you'd like to uh, attend, um, the link uh, is at, uh, right here and also on the COAC uh, website, which is www.counciloac.org, and uh, you can and you can register for the fall gathering. Uh, as you notice, there are activities Saturday, uh, and then Friday there are uh, some things happening. So those who may want to go down a day early and stay overnight and then do the events on, on Saturday and be nice and refreshed. Now speaking of COAC, uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon does need a representative to attend the uh, fall and spring gatherings. There are two gatherings a year. But also attend the one hour Zoom meetings with other Audubon chapter representatives and the COAC board. So you can see from the bullet points, um, again, simply attending once a month for an hour uh, throughout the year, uh, reporting on what Western Cuyahoga does to the COAC uh, folks, and report back to Western Cuyahoga what uh, has transpired at the COAC meetings. Uh, as I mentioned, attending the two gatherings, which take place around the, the state, since there are so many chapters in Ohio that are part of COAC, we like to move things around. 
And then, uh, of course, the board will assist in getting a representative updated on COAC and Western Cuyahoga Audubon information just so we don't throw you in cold. That would be very unfair. So if anybody is interested, again, very easy, and we will help you walk you through it. Ah, I know it's only September, but mark your calendar. Sunday, December 26th is the 2021 Christmas bird count in our circle, which is called the Lakewood Circle. Uh, there'll be a lot more information coming up in the next newsletter and featured blogs. And doesn't that photograph look delightful? Everybody should be nodding their head yes. Um, yeah, people go out uh, no matter what the weather. So it's, it's a lot of fun. We did a great uh, Christmas bird count last December. And uh, it's, it's a little challenging, but a lot of fun. So mark your calendar, please, Sunday, December 26th. Michelle Brocious, a uh, board member, will uh, speak up about uh, several of the field trips and things that we have happening. Michelle, how are you doing tonight? I'm great. Thank you, Nancy. Hello, everyone. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so as Nancy said, I'm going to be discussing uh, bird walks and virtual field trips that we have coming up. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, please join us on September 11th, that's this Saturday at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center parking lot for our second Saturday bird walk. We meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Bill Dunninger, Dave Gross Kemper, and Ken Gover will be leading the walk. Our next slide, please. All right, so this past second Saturday was held on August 14th. And here is Bill Dininger's report. Uh, he says the weather was excellent the second Saturday of the month bird walk for August 2021. It started at 70 degrees and finished at 79 degrees. It was sunny with a nice breeze. 23 observers tallied 44 species. We had the usual birds during the three hour walk. We had an unusual flyover of three double crested cormorants. There were several large groups of blackbird flyovers. We estimated about 20 common grackles, about 20 red winged blackbirds several cowbirds, a few starlings, and many more that could not be identified. Two pileated woodpeckers were observed. My best highlights were our resident barred owl perched high in a pine and a broad-winged hawk soaring overhead. All right, the next slide, please. All right, so in partnership with the Tremont West Development Corporation, we are hosting monthly bird walks the fourth Saturday of the month, starting at 9 a.m., meeting at the Towpath Public parking lot on Abbey Avenue. From here, we bird the Ohio and Erie Canal towpath trail towards Grant Flats. Nancy Howell is co-leading co this month's bird walk with guest leader Julie West on September 25th. Uh, this past Tremont bird walk was held on August 28th. It was the dog days of summer, and yet 10 birders showed up and sighted 28 species, including a Caspian tern, spotted sandpiper, green heron, and 26 double-crested cormorants. All right, next slide, please. All right, last month our virtual field trip was held at the Rookery in Geauga County in search of the Eastern Phoebe, the virtual meetup during which I will present the scrapbook of everyone's photos, journaling, and bird list takes place the second Wednesday of the month, which means it is taking place tomorrow, uh, September 8th at 7 p.m. Even if you didn't have a chance to visit the Rookery last month, you're still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. All right, next slide, please. Uh, September's virtual field trip takes place at Headlands Dune State Nature Preserve in search of fall warblers. During your visit to the preserve, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. Take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired by what you've seen, tally identified species, or journal your experience. Send your items to me, and your contribution will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. We will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting our website, wcaudubon.org, and clicking the field trips tile, and then field reports 2021. All right, next slide, please. All right, the evening bird walks are perfect if you need a nice walk to wind down from the day and enjoy the birds that are active in the evening. 
These walks are held on the third Wednesday of each month, each taking place at a different location. Uh, since sunset is beginning to be earlier, we have updated the start time of these walks to 6 p.m. They used to be held at 7 throughout the summer, uh, but going forward, they're at 6. Uh, this month, the walk takes place at the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve and will be led by Nancy Howell and Marianne Romito. Please register by clicking the Evening Bird Walks tile on the WC Audubon homepage. All right, next slide, please. Thank you. All right, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded like this speaker series meeting and our virtual field trips that I mentioned and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel. So please be sure to subscribe. All right, next slide. I'm going to mention a real quick thing. Thank, for, thank you so much, Michelle. I hope everybody was looking at the beautiful photographs that accompanied the, the information that Michelle was sharing. Uh, Michelle has become a fantastic photographer. Uh, Tom Fishburne has also uh, given us many, many slides uh, or shared with us some slides that we are using for those as well. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Kurt, yeah, Kurt Nitsky was not able to be here this evening. Uh, he has been running a blue, our Bluebird project. And uh, as of now, the, all the bluebirds have fledged. The tree swallows have fledged. Uh, this, this was a nest of, this was a second um, uh, brood of eastern bluebirds uh, for the project. And again, we're always getting funds or needing funds for the project to uh, add more boxes, to uh, increase our bluebird trails. Right now we only have five boxes and again some of them are paired up so there's uh, bluebirds at some and tree swallows at, at others. Uh, sometimes we even get uh, house wrens. So again think about uh, a little bit of a donation to the Jean Misty Memorial Fund. Karu Simone was not able to be here this evening. It's a very busy evening for many of our board folks. And uh, she's in charge of our uh, plant sale, as well as some of our events that we have going on. And one of our big events is the uh, Tremont Arts and Cultural Festival, as you can see, Saturday and Sunday, September 18th and 19th, um, starting uh, at on Saturday. Uh, starting at, ooh, I have to double check the, the time, starting at 12 noon and running until 7 p.m. on Sunday. Uh, the event starts at 12 noon and runs until 5. There will be a bird walk at 2 o'clock, so that should be fun. Plus, again, we will be selling uh, bird-friendly coffee. We will be selling beautiful uh, bird uh, uh, friendly plants, plants that provide seed or nectar, uh, things like that. And uh, also we'll be uh, selling what's called tilt soil and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So it's a lot of fun and we do need uh, additional volunteers for both of those days to help staff our, our tent to uh, give information or give out information to visitors, to help with bird walks, uh, and there are so there's many many things. And if we get a lot of volunteers, that also is going to give a chance to some of the volunteers to walk around, check out some of the other vendors, some of the music, eat some food, and then give uh, a, one of our other volunteer a break. So it's again it's just nice to have a number of people. Uh, staffing these events. Again, we, we do offer the uh, coffee that is uh, bird friendly. Uh, it is through Birds and Beans and it is a Smithsonian shade grown, bird friendly, organic, fair trade. It is everything. And uh, orders are to be in before September 10th. Uh, as you can see, there is a button on the home page where coffee can be ordered. Or if you're going to be stopping by the Tremont Arts and Cultural Fest 
we will have some coffee for sale there. And as I mentioned, the Tilf soil products. We uh, will be having some of that at the uh, Tremont Arts and Cultural Fest. But this is awesome stuff. It is produced from composted, primarily plant-based food waste, all uh, collected in Cleveland and done by a group called the Rust Belt Riders. And they have just grown like topsy. As a matter of fact, ne next month's program will be done by Dan Brown of the Rust Belt Riders talking about the story and the history. I'll get to that later. So this is fabulous stuff. Again, just a, a wonderful composted product. Uh, again, so things don't have to go into landfills. As you can see, there's a button on the home page where you can order the soil. As I mentioned, there are always volunteer opportunities, uh, not just for the plant sale and Tremont Arts and Cultural Fest, but uh, plant and soil uh, delivery, um, uh, coffee deliveries, and many, many, many other things, too. So again, we'd like to hear from you uh, as a member. Um, remember, this is your organization, so please contact Karu, and you can see uh, her email there, Karu Saboni at wcaudubon.org, and say, put your hand up and say, yes, I can volunteer. I've got, I've got this skill and this skill and this skill. So we'd love to have you involved. Alrighty, I think people are tired of hearing me. So Michelle, uh, you'll be talking about the book discussion. Yes, yes. Um, so I am super excited to announce the relaunching of the WCAS book discussion series um, hosted by Drina Nemes. And uh, next slide, please. Here are some of the books that we will be um, reading over the, the next uh, year or so. So the, the book club, the relaunching of the book club will be on a quarterly basis, the fourth Tuesday of um, the quarter. So October, January, April, and July, we will have a book club discussion. Um, and it looks like on the home page, there is a button on the wcaudubon.org homepage for registering for the book club. Next slide, please. All right, so on Tuesday, October 26th, we will be reading uh, Where the World Ends by Geraldine McCoffrian. Um, and I'm super excited about it. I've just, I was telling Nancy and Betsy, I just bought my book. Uh, so here's a brief description. Every summer, Quill and his friends are put ashore on a remote sea stack to hunt birds. But this summer, no one arrives to take them home. Surely nothing but the end of the world can explain why they've been abandoned. Cold, starving, and clinging to life in the grip of a murderous ocean, how will they survive such a forsaken place of stone and sea? Um, so there's a link there to the uh, WCS Virtual Conference Center. That's where we will have our virtual discussion of the book on October 26th. Uh, please register and get the book. It's available on Amazon. I do want to just plug that if you log into the smile.amazon.com, uh, you can add WC Audubon as your um, charity and a percentage of every purchase goes to us. So it's just still your same account, just a different web address, smile.amazon.com. All right, next slide. That's it for me, thank you. Oh, thanks, Michelle, and thanks for the plug for Amazon Smile. <laughs> um, so, so some of you folks may want to purchase the book, but you know, also if you don't want to have another book hanging around your house, well, you can get one from the library. Make sure you get it in, in advance so you have time to read, and, and it sounds very thrilling. It sounds like a good October book because it's uh, a little on the scary side, I think. Alrighty, Western Cuyahoga also has a photo contest, and the August photo contest uh, bird was the red-winged blackbird. And our winner, Colleen Sidlecki, look at that lovely photo of that red-winged blackbird just looking at us and with that red and the yellow epaulets. 
so beautiful. So we are so pleased that Colleen um, uh, received that the winner winning award for this photo for August. That's beautiful. But don't fret. We've got another photo bird uh, for September, and it is the great blue heron. So you can go anywhere from September 1 through the 30th. Send in your photos. Uh, the winners will be announced at our next members meeting. And so there are youth and adult categories. And each photo you'd like to, to register is $5. Uh, then you will be eligible for a contest and additional prizes. Ooh. So really, uh, uh, any of the uh, donations that are made for photo contests and things of this sort uh, do help to uh, help, uh, help us with conservation education. So again, check the website and there is a home button for the photography uh, contest. Ice cream, Ooh, no matter what time of the year, Mitchell's homemade ice cream is delicious, or frozen yogurt, or sorbet, or even vegan ice cream. And Western Cuyahoga has $10 denomination gift cards. If you are interested in purchasing one or more, um, perhaps as a gift, perhaps for yourself, or a friend or family member, uh, babysitter, dog sitter, whatever, um, you can go to our store, we can either mail you the card or we can drop it off right in your own hands. So, so please take a look and think about, mmm, ice cream, I want some right now. <laughs> Alright, as I mentioned earlier, next month's program, Dan Brown will be talking about the Rust Belt Riders composting program trash to treasure and uh, again how they got started um, what their products are and I think you'll be amazed at, at what you'll hear about how much food waste uh, is uh, in this world and how they're keeping so much of the food waste out of the out of landfills and making this wonderful soil product so I, I can't wait to hear it I heard a little bit of months ago and I want more because it's just so inspiring. But this evening we are here with Sarah Winicki who is the PhD candidate uh, from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and I am totally amazed when I was looking at, at the curriculum vitae uh, and information. I think it was Betsy that, that um, linked Sarah and uh, a program together because I was looking I'm like this person has so much going on. Um, she, Sarah is working on uh, her PH, on a PhD in ecology, uh, evolution and conservation biology and has numerous science presentations for youngsters, for uh, Ohio Avian Research uh, Conference, North American Ornithological Conference, I mean from kids all the way up to the big wigs. Uh, Sarah's pa uh, passion, and I love this, is science communication. Bringing science to the community through outreach like in schools, uh, nature centers, um, zoos, libraries, and so there's a lot that Sarah is is up to and I think in the future we're going to see a lot more of Sarah and soon to be Dr. Sarah Winicky. Um, so in going through the presentations this one really stood out to me teaching the scientific process linking hypotheses to data using migratory birds and the reason it, it stuck out is because it's an interactive program that Sarah and Dr. Alice Boyle developed and I, I'm just, oh, I just can't wait to get my hands on, on the presentation. So uh, let me introduce Sarah with Nikki. I am so happy that you are here this evening and uh, I understand that you will take questions during the presentation. Is that correct? 
Can you hear me? I can hear, yes. Excellent, yeah. If you want to ask questions, go ahead and unmute yourself, and I'll have some opportunities for discussion um, when you want to, if we want to talk about stuff as I go. Um, Thank you. So I have the share link now, so I'm going to start sharing. Um, let's see if I... I've never used this call software before, so I'm doing my best. Can you see my screen at all yet? Yes, can I can see your screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. There's a bit of a lag on my end. I hope I'm not lagging too bad for you all. Okay. Okay, are we all on my screen now? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'm in the middle of a thunderstorm, so my internet is going in and out a little bit, so I apologize for that. Um, but if you don't have any questions for me to start with, I will launch right into my program. Um, as you saw, this was the, the title that I, I gave for this talk, Teaching the Scientific Process, Linking Hypotheses to Data Using Migratory Birds. Um, and as was mentioned, this was a program that I came up with for students along with Dr. Alice Boyle, who is my master's advisor. Um, my slides aren't advancing. Come on. There we go. Um, so this is something that I did in classrooms where I would bring students specimens of birds and ask them to, you know, look at these dead birds and look at their beaks. Um, I would give them videos of these birds eating food and ask them to collect data from the videos, which is something that we do a lot as a field ecologists, um, specifically focus on what these birds are eating. And then I wanted them to connect all these data to the range maps of these birds to say, look, here's a heron. It's got this perfect stabbing bill ready to collect fish. Um, and it lives here year round. You can see from this map, it's a permanent breeding resident of the state of Kansas, where I was at the time, and Ohio and Illinois. And so I had a range of different birds that ate different foods and had different migration patterns. And I ultimately asked students to hypothesize about why these birds migrate and then connect it to food. Um, and that was ultimately the extent of that program was um, hoping students, these young children, would build this connection um, that birds rely on certain food sources and that could force some of them to move throughout the season when the weather changes. When I was adjusting this program for um, you all today, I was um, a little hesitant um, because I, I'm like, wow, everybody here knows birds already. You already know that birds need to move to get to food sources. You're not third graders. <laughs> um, so I ended up um, chatting with some folks in the club and I adjusted my talk a little bit. So I'm going to still be teaching the scientific process. We made linking hypotheses to data. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more closely to my research and talk about cowbirds, which are a migratory bird. Um, but they are what I've studied for the last few years, what I continue to study. Um, so hopefully that isn't too offensive to you all that I'm going to switch you up a little bit. Um, and if you want more information about that workshop, I, I can provide you with all those materials. But yes, ultimately the, the conclusion is that birds migrate for food. <laughs> um, uh, this is my, my nice professional photo. This is what I look like on my website. Here's all my contact information. I'll throw this slide up again when I'm done. Um, but I thought you might want to want to know where to, to find me. So there's my email um, and my website, and I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter, um, both me as an individual and my, my project, Grow Bird Grow. Um, I like to share that photo of me looking professional because more often than not, I end up looking like this. And this is what I look like when I'm collecting data in the field. Um, and as you can see, I spend a lot of time handling birds, so I just at the beginning of every talk, I like to say, you know, I have training and permission and permits to approach nests and handle birds. Um, don't do any of those things if you don't have that training and permission and permits. 
Um, I'm an Ohioan at heart. I, I come from Medina, Ohio, a little south of Cleveland. Um, so I was really lucky as a youth to join the Ohio Young Birders Club, um, which is a, a group for 12 to 18-year-olds. Um, I was able to go on birding trips when I was very small. So here I am uh, on Lake Erie uh, looking for gulls in January. I was also able to speak at conferences, and that kind of jump-started my speaking career. And I was even able to be um, an ecotourism um, intern. So I was able to go to the Galapagos Islands, of all places, and help lead folks on an ecotourism tour there, which was very, very neat. So that's just my plug for um, supporting the young birders in your life, um, the kids who may be running around a little bit too excitedly <laughs> um, on your bird walks, but it's worth investing in the future of birding and conservation. I went to Denison University, which is uh, in Licking County, so a little, a little north of Columbus. Um, I didn't have any ornithology advisors there because there aren't any ornithologists on staff. Um, so I curated the bird collection that was there, and then I ended up researching with Ohio State University, um, where I studied red-winged blackbirds on the Lake Erie Islands, um, especially the Bass Islands. Um, by my sophomore year of undergrad, I moved to the Boyle Laboratory at Kansas State University. Um, so this is Dr. Alice Boyle, um, ice skating here with us. She leads a lab that studies birds in Costa Rica and in the grasslands of Kansas. So I guess I kind of picked the, perhaps the lamer option, <laughs> sticking to the Kansas grasslands. Um, but I'm going to be drawing from a lot of that work today in this talk. And finally, as we mentioned, I'm now at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I work with Drs. Mark Halber and TJ Benson. Dr. Halber, in particular, is notorious for his work on brown-headed cowbirds. Um, this is the, the neon sign outside of our laboratory saying Cowbird Lab. Um, so for today, I want to talk a little bit, just really basic, like what is the scientific method and what are hypotheses? Then I'm going to show you a little bit of my work and show how scientists use hypotheses, um, hypotheses in action. And ultimately, I'm going to tell you the story about sparrows and cowbirds and ask you to start thinking through hypotheses um, based on some of the data that I've collected. Um, and I'll warn you in advance, I don't have answers for this. And that's kind of the fun of doing science is that um, I'm not going to ultimately have a, a conclusion here, but I'm hoping that we can have a discussion about these data that I present um, and can learn some stuff about cowboys and sparrows along the way. Um, so, you may have heard about the scientific process in school. It's often some sort of circular thing here. Um, you start with an observation or a question. So in my case, as a field biologist, it's often going out and just looking at birds doing things. Um, so go out in the field, you see a bird doing a cool behavior, you see some funny colors on a bird, you ask, how did this happen? You know, how did this bird evolve this? Why is this happening? How does it affect the biology of the bird? Next, you do some research. You hit the library, or in, uh, in my case now, in my generation, you hit the online PDF that the library has stored. Um, and you start to look and see, OK, has anyone ever encountered this before? Have they um, you know, done any research, any experiments on this? What knowledge do we have already about this observation? Has it already been answered? Um, if there isn't already an answer, you can start building these hypotheses. So hypothesis by just simple definition is a supposition or a proposed explanation made on the basis of limited evidence and is a starting point for further investigation. So you get that little bit of data, that little observation you have, you build some sort of explanation for it um, that you can then test. So you can test it with an experiment, you can go out and collect data from wild animals doing wild animal things. And when you have these data, you analyze them. Um, you use some, often, in my case, statistical models to see if the likelihood of the observation occurring is more likely than random chance. And then you report those conclusions. And for scientists, this means writing some sort of publication that's shared with other scientists. It means going to conferences and talking with scientists about those things. Um, it means going to Audubon clubs and, and reporting the conclusion that you have from your work. But kind of the most critical bit of the scientific method is that it's circular. Once you have the conclusion, that is very, very rarely the end of your inquiry. It often leads to more observations and more questions, or other researchers see something similar in their field, 
and they'll start this whole process again. Um, and so the scientific method just rolls and rolls and rolls, and that's what keeps all of us employed. <laughs> So I started my scientific inquiry for these sparrows at this Kansas Prairie Biological Station. So this is in Northeast Kansas. It's associated with the Nature Conservancy and Kansas State University. And it's this neat little place. Um, so here's a little map. It's split into these little watersheds. Um, overall, it's about 35 square kilometers. And each watershed is grazed by either nothing, so no big grazers, or bison or cattle. Um, and then it's burned at different fire intervals. So we go out and we light the prairie on fire, um, sometimes every year, sometimes every three years, some units every 20 years. And so you can imagine that the different combinations of, you know, bison and one year fire versus no bison and 20 years without fire means that you have this really fascinating mosaic um, of different landscape types with some units have a lot of trees, some are mostly grass and everywhere in between. It's a really lovely place to work. Um, so I know growing up in Ohio, we had a lot of um, preconceptions about what Kansas looks like. So I just wanted to orient you to the fact that uh, this part of Kansas, the Flint Hills part of Kansas, is really quite lovely. Um, and so I ended up moving from the Columbus area out to this prairie for the summertime um, to study these sparrows. And I was given this preliminary data. So this is that observation that you start with at the start of the scientific method. So I'm working with these grasshopper sparrows, a delightful bird that's um, present in Ohio, but is present in very, very high numbers in Kansas. And across this map of this Kansas prairie, you can see that the sparrows aren't like evenly distributed. So all these little, little green clumps are different sparrow territories. And you can see in some places, they're really, really bunched together where there's lots of sparrows all on one spot. And there are other portions of the prairie where there are no sparrows at all. And so we were fascinated by this. We're like, OK, looking at these data, why are these birds aggregating their territories in some parts of the prairie and leaving other seemingly wonderful parts of the prairie completely empty? And so I kind of dove in with this observation. And I started my first research project. So I had this observation that these birds were aggregating. I, I hit the books a little bit. Um, and started thinking of some of the reasons why, and it generated a few different hypotheses. First off, maybe these sparrows are just aggregating around resources. So maybe there's more food in those particular pockets of the prairie. Maybe there's more females available, so these males are choosing to stay close to each other um, to find these females nearby. And so we could test some of these things. We went out and we used uh, insect sweep nets to see how much food was available in places where the sparrows were and they weren't. We tried to catch females as often as possible to see if they, there were more in some areas than others. We were also fascinated by an alternative hypothesis. We thought maybe the sparrows were aggregating to increase protection for their nest, thinking that maybe if one sparrow saw a snake nearby and it started freaking out and giving its alarm call, that that could inform any sparrows near it um, who could then protect their nests. And so we had these couple of working hypotheses. Um, and one of my colleagues actually presented predator models to sparrows that were in these aggregations or not um, and recorded their behavior. And so from this project um, that she did, my, my coll collaborator Stephanie, um, she was able to say that it didn't seem that this was the case. The sparrows didn't seem to be increasing their protection behavior, um, which was fascinating. So when I joined this project, I wanted to take this a step further, and I wanted to look at the actual success of their nest. So maybe they don't respond to a rubber snake that Stephanie presented them, but maybe there is some sort of protection element here, um, and that's what's saving these nests. So I had to find the nest. It's kind of hard. Um, they are quite buried in the grass. They nest on the ground in these little woven nests with little covers over the top of them. So it's kind of frustrating to find them. But when you do, you're blessed with um, getting to be with these tiny little sparrow babies, um, which I think are absolutely adorable. And um, another hypothesis I was pursuing was that maybe these males were, when aggregated, um, it allowed them to kind of cheat on each other. <laughs> um, so maybe the female was mating with multiple males. And so when I found these nests, I started taking blood samples from these babies. Um, so I had to wait until they were relatively old um, so I could take blood out of their wing 
just the same way that like a doctor takes blood out of your vein. It's the same vein that I that I use for these birds. So I got to handle a lot of baby birds when they were pretty old, um, which was very neat. Ultimately, this research, um, I made it through this testing it with some experiments. I analyzed this data, and then I reported the conclusion ultimately in a paper. Um, but as, as I'm sure you can anticipate, that wasn't the end of our study on these sparrows. The scientific method keeps on looping. And so I, I kept coming back to, to these baby birds, and I was fascinated by the fact that I, I tried to come to the nest when they were about six days old, when they should look like these birds on the left. But sometimes they look more like these birds on the right, where they're a little bit smaller. You can sort of see their feathers aren't as well developed. And certainly one of these babies is much, much smaller than the other. And so I, it kind of led me to this question, just, you know, why do grasshopper sparrow babies vary so much in size? They're all the same age. They're all living on the same, you know, 35 square kilometer prairie. Why, why are they so different? So this kind of restarted that loop all again. I had a new observation. Um, it was time to make some new predictions to test for this experiment. And this ended up ultimately being my master's work for my master's degree. One thing that really struck me when I was looking at these sparrow nests is that these sparrow babies aren't often alone. They're often accompanied by a sibling that is not the same species as them. So in this case, there are these parasites, these brown-headed cowbirds on the right. Um, they're much bigger than the sparrows. So I thought, you know, maybe having one of these, these cowbird nestlings um, impacts the growth of these sparrow babies. Maybe that's why some of them are so small. If you've never heard of cowbirds, um, I would say that that is a bummer. Um, they are one of my favorite birds. They are North America's brood parasite. Um, so that means that instead of building their own nest and taking care of their own babies, they lay their egg in other birds' nests and raise and force those birds to raise their own babies. Um, so here are some males. They were originally known as bison birds. Um, and you see this sort of scene all the time at Conza. This is a picture I took of these brown-headed cowbirds flying near one of our bison on the property. Um, there's this really nice story that they evolved this brood parasitism strategy so that they could lay their eggs and then keep following the wandering bison and they didn't have to stick around and raise their babies. Um, that's not probably how it actually happened. It's a really lovely story. Um, most likely these cowbirds actually had an ancestor that evolved this parasitism strategy in Central America, um, which was before they moved into North America, before they encountered bison. Um, still a fun association, though. There's a lot of, of brown-headed cowbirds in Kansas. Um, this is a, a kind of common site in the area. Um, this is just a, in, just a little part of a much larger group of birds. Um, so there, there are a lot of cowbirds, so perhaps that's what it's causing this variation in the size of these baby sparrows that I witnessed as I worked with these sparrows on the prairie. Um, so yes, here are some sparrow eggs. So there's five little sparrow eggs, and you can see this gigantic cowbird egg that is included in the nest. And you can see that this big cowbird baby, they can sometimes be three times the size of the little sparrows. So I'm like, okay, this seems like a very reasonable hypothesis. You know, probably having a cowbird in the nest means that these sparrows don't get as much food or something, and they grow much slower. And so ultimately, I started building these statistical models where I was looking at the growth rate of these sparrow babies, and I thought the presence or absence of cowbirds would directly impact that growth rate. But I like to make things complicated, so I also wanted to look at food. So I thought, you know, maybe sparrows just vary in the amount of food that they're capable of bringing to their babies. Um, so maybe food impacts this growth rate. Maybe some sparrows just bring more. Um, I also wanted to look at predators. Um, so this can be kind of complicated in the theory, but um, it's often the case that birds will grow faster if there's more predators nearby. We're not exactly sure how, um, but if they need to leave that nest very early to, to flee the predators, they might grow faster. And to make it even more complicated, it's likely that the presence of cowbirds impacts both of these. So cowbirds are very noisy. If you've ever seen a cowbird baby, even when you feed them, they just keep begging, begging, begging. And so it could mean that the sparrow parents overwork themselves 
bring tons of food to the nest. It might actually inadvertently help the sparrow babies because they're bringing so much more food to that nest each time. So there might be an interaction there between the cowbirds and the food. And that really loudly begging cowbird baby might also attract predators. So there might be an interaction there between the cowbirds and the predators too. So this is my master's project. I collected data on predators by um, keeping track of when the nests were eaten or not. I collect data on food by putting little tiny spy cameras at the nest and recording when the parents came. And then ultimately I collected something like eight months of 24 seven footage um, that I then had to watch um, to gather the data from the, that footage. Then I could, with all of these, um, uh, data, I could address this hypothesis structure, all these different ideas that I think are impacting this observation. But I ultimately found um, a kind of mixed bag. Um, this is preliminary, we haven't published it yet. But we do think that cowbirds decrease sparrow growth rate. So that will be what we report and what we share. That will be the end of this scientific loop that we have, have uh, done. Um, which is good that it's over as I have moved to Illinois. <laughs> but as you might imagine, um, in finishing one scientific loop, you are just left with more questions. And ultimately the question I wanna pose to you all tonight is, okay, we know that sparrows um, decrease, their growth rates are decreased when cowbirds are present. Why do sparrows allow cowbirds to parasitize their nest in the first place? So what is, like, why do they even let that happen? Why don't they fight the cowbirds or remove the cowbird egg? Why are these sparrows raising cowbird babies? And so normally I'd be doing this in a classroom and so I would open it up and have everyone discuss with each other. Um, but if you want to unmute yourself and jump on in um, and just shout out ideas, we are in that preliminary hypothesis stage at this point. Any thoughts? There's no wrong answers. They don't know it. It's not that they allow yeah. it, they don't know it. Yeah, they might not even know that the cowbirds are there um, until it's too late, right? Until they have a gigantic monster baby in their nest. That's an excellent hypothesis. Any other guesses? Is it because maybe the cowbird females are bigger than the sparrows and just, you know, hey, you're smaller and I'm just going to push my way into your nest. Yeah, maybe these cowbirds are just gigantic brutes um, and the sparrows, I mean, these sparrows only weigh like 17 grams, so like a, a handful of quarters, you know, they're, they're not very big. So maybe, maybe they just can't compete against these cowbirds. They can't prevent them from laying the eggs, and then they're just stuck with the eggs when they get them. Any other but, thoughts? But is there a possibility of a symbiotic relationship that they do indeed get something from it? If indeed yes. they are just a little bit larger, uh, perhaps, uh, and this is more of a an actionable type of thing, is, is it perhaps that they are more aggressive in that while that cannot be good for the littler ones there, it could help fend off um, types of predators. So it would seem to me that something would have to be, it would have to be ruled out that they're not getting a symbiotic relationship because it's highly probable to me that a symbiotic relationship could be while why they are still allowed in the nest or as yeah. they could be fat dumb and happy and say oh well the more the merrier yes it's absolutely a possibility that there's some benefit in this for the sparrows that something about the presence of cowbirds helps those sparrows in some way or another um, and we know this some other species of cowbirds that live in south america they will actually eat the different pests in the nest. Um, so there might be like insects that infect the nest and even insects like, like blowflies that will grow inside the nestlings. And so there's actually evidence that these cowbirds will gently remove those flies from the other nestlings. Um, and so it is beneficial to those birds to be raised alongside cowbirds 
So maybe that's happening. There's something like that happening here in the Kansas grasslands in addition to the South American system. Excellent idea. Any other thoughts? So the next step, we have some hypotheses. Um, the next step would be then to dig in to that literature, um, to look at what other people have researched, um, to you know talk to other experts, um, to tweet about it and see what other people think on Twitter, um, the kind of things I do as a scientist when I start having these questions. And so I, I came up with some questions beforehand, so I'll make sure I try to address everyone's as well as these. Um, but the first one is like, maybe they just can't tell. Maybe they don't know that they've been parasitized. Um, and it's often the case that cowbirds will remove a sparrow egg when they lay their own egg. And there's a lot of reasons why that might happen, and I can address those later. But if a sparrow leaves and there's four eggs in the nest, um, and she comes back and there are four eggs in the nest, but one of them is just switched out and it's a cowbird egg instead of her own egg, maybe she just can't tell the difference. And they do look kind of similar. So we have in the back a cowbird egg, big spotty, um, and then a spotty sparrow egg. It's like maybe they just can't tell the difference. Or maybe maybe if they can get, maybe they could almost tell the difference, but it's not worth the risk of throwing out their own egg on accident so they don't act on it. Um, so that's definitely a possibility. Maybe these cowbird eggs just look too similar to sparrow eggs. Another possibility that we haven't really addressed yet is that some birds simply haven't evolved defense strategies for cowbirds. Um, this is likely the results of cowbirds being associated very, very tightly with these grasslands in the central plains until European colonizers opened up the forests on the east and west coast. So you can see here, these cowbirds started extending their range from these central grasslands into the eastern forests in the 1800s um, and have continued to spread um, up into like Alaska in the 1980s and they're continuing to spread across the continent. So many, many species just haven't interacted with these birds prior to the last, you know, 200 years. They may have not evolved any defense strategies, you know, in their evolutionary history, they've never seen these birds before. Um, but I will point out, here's the range map for those grasshopper sparrows. You can see that they breed in these central plains and they have for a very long time. Um, so they've likely encountered these cowbirds throughout their evolutionary history as well. Um, and so this may not be the best hypothesis, but it's certainly one of them. Um, I'll mention that, you know, this cowbird parasitism is costly for small birds especially, and so many have evolved defenses. Um, so some of them, like our common yellow warbler here, they'll actually see a cowbird egg and they'll often build a new bottom of their nest on top of that cowbird egg. So here's a picture of a warbler nest. You can see four warbler eggs and then buried underneath them, kind of half buried in the bottom of that nest, is actually a cowbird egg. And so that egg will never make contact with the female warbler's body when she's sitting on those eggs and incubating them. So that cowbird will never get warm enough to grow and it'll never hatch. So it's like maybe um, these grasshopper sparrows could be doing this. Um, and we actually have some evidence of that. Um, sometimes we were collecting the nest for a separate research project and sometimes we would find cowbird eggs buried. Um, so it looks like they might be able to identify cowbird eggs to an extent but that doesn't explain why I still see baby cowbirds. So if, if they can build over them, why don't they always, you know? Other hosts, like our common American robin, get parasitized by cowbirds, but they simply reach in, they pick up that cowbird egg in their beak, they fly away from their nest, and they just toss the cowbird egg out. Um, we know this happens almost immediately. I study robins now. That's what I do here at Illinois. Um, so it's like the second these robins come back and see a, a cowbird egg, that cowbird egg is gone. So it's like maybe grasshopper sparrows aren't capable of doing that. You know, they're smaller than these robins. They don't have a very big beak. You know, that's another hypothesis. Maybe they're just incapable of removing it if the cowbirds manage to sneak in. Um, but here is some evidence to the contrary. So this is the kind of video footage that I had to analyze um, from these little cameras that I have set up right at the nest. So here, this big blurry blob is a grasshopper sparrow male. I'll play this video. You can see him reach into the nest and he just rolls the cowbird egg right out. Um, so I know that these birds are capable 
of rolling out these cowbird eggs, yet they don't very often. Um, and in fact, if you looked really closely in this video, behind this male's head, see if I can get a good shot of it, you can actually see a baby bagging. That's a baby cowbird. So I know that this male is capable of removing cowbird eggs. Why doesn't he? Why is he still raising a cowbird in his nest if he could get rid of them? Um, So here I just kind of collected the hypotheses that I had thought of beforehand, and I can add the ones that we thought of that were all wonderful. So it's like maybe these sparrows just didn't have enough time to evolve cowbird defenses. Maybe these cowbird eggs look too similar to sparrow eggs. They're just hard to tell apart. Um, maybe the sparrows just don't even understand at all that they've been parasitized. Maybe the sparrows can't easily bury those cowbird eggs or can't easily remove those cowbird eggs. Um, and some of the other possibilities, maybe there's some positive benefit to these cowbirds. Maybe they're protecting these birds, um, these sparrows from predators. Um, there's a, a lot of good hypotheses that you can work with here. One last one that I'll mention um, that I didn't know about until I started looking into the literature, doing that, that step where you, you go ahead and you read what other people have published. When I did that, I learned that cowbirds are mobsters. So this is actually a real picture somebody took of a cowbird. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so cowbirds will engage in this behavior that we call mafia behavior. And we call it this mafia hypothesis. And this claims that cowbirds may retaliate if their eggs and babies are rejected or poorly cared for, ultimately destroying the host nest. So they act like a mafia enforcer. They come back to their nest days after they laid their egg. They look in that nest. They see if that sparrow has rejected their egg or not. And if the sparrow's rejected that egg, they will kill everybody in the nest. And that will keep the sparrow from ever doing that again. <laughs> um, and so this is, again, another hypothesis, this mafia hypothesis that I learned about when I started talking to other cowbird researchers and networking and reading in the literature. So that's a good list of hypotheses. I just tacked that one onto the end. Mafia retaliation prevents sparrows from evolving defenses um, because the benefits of rejecting that egg don't outweigh the cost of getting the mafia hit on them that occurs if they reject that egg. Which seems like a pretty great place to start on our scientific method here. Um, so we have this observation that sparrows raise cowbirds We've re done a little bit of research. We found some hypotheses. Um, we have a nice list. Now, how would we go about testing these things? Um, so I kind of spitballed a bit here. Um, I'm not studying sparrows anymore in the system, but this is how I would do it. So if we want to think about whether these sparrows have had enough time to evolve cowbird defenses, we'll go back again to these range maps and be like, OK, it looks like they've overlapped. You know, they're, they're currently overlapping from what we know of historical records. These cowbirds lived in the Great Plains. From what we know of historical records, these grasshopper sparrows lived in the Great Plains. Um, it looks like they've been interacting for a really long time. It would really help if we had good fossil records of birds. Um, it's hard to find good fossils of birds. Um, they don't preserve very well. They don't have very strong bones. Um, but we do have fossils, surprisingly, from the east and west coast of cowbirds back during um, the Ice Age, the Pleistocene, when there were grasslands across most of the continent. So these cowbirds have lived in the grasslands for a really long time um, and extended to both coasts when both coasts were covered in grassland, which is pretty cool. And we have the same evidence of grasshopper sparrows in those same places, especially from um, an underground tunnel in the Bahamas, which I think is really cool, um, that has grasshopper sparrow bones. Um, so we know these species have been here for a really long time. They probably have enough time to evolve strategies for cowbirds if that was a possibility. So that would be my best test for that hypothesis. Now maybe these cowbird eggs look too similar to sparrow eggs and they don't even realize they've been parasitized at all. Um, and so we've done this kind of work with other species. So this is a um, cuckoo study, I think. So cuckoos are another type of brood parasite, not the cuckoos in North America, the cuckoos in Europe. Um, and so they made these fake eggs that look like the cuckoos and their hosts, 
and they ended up, you know, making 3D models of eggs and presenting them to their hosts and being like, okay, do you reject it when it really, really mimics, um, or in this case, I guess, really mimics your egg, or when it really doesn't mimic your egg at all? And so they were able to present these model eggs to these these are host birds, so it'd be like taking these fake eggs, giving them to sparrows, and being like, at what point do these look more like a sparrow egg and more like a cowbird egg? At what point are you going to start rejecting these eggs? Which is kind of complicated, but hopefully that makes sense. Um, you can also ask, you know, if these sparrows can easily bury the eggs or remove the eggs. If I was going to test this, I would simply give them fake cowbird eggs. So I do this with my robins. I 3D print eggs, and then I paint them so they look like little cowbirds. I put them in the robin nest. As I mentioned, the robins pick them up and they immediately throw them away, and then I lose the, the $10 3D printed egg that I just painted. Um, so for the sparrows that don't reject these eggs, I could give them these eggs in some sort of standardized way and see if they bury them and see if they reject them. Um, so I would know, because right now if I go to a sparrow nest and there's no cowbird egg, I don't know if it simply never had a cowbird egg, or if that sparrow has already rejected a cowbird egg that was there. But if I give them a fake cowbird egg, I know for sure it has one, so I can ask if that sparrow has rejected it or not. Um, just a side note, this 3D printing thing is really fun. Um, so we do things like, we ask questions like, how does a robin know when an egg is an egg, and when it's something like a stick that falls into the nest? So we made these weird eggs. You can see this 3D printed egg that's got some like weird angles, kind of like a dice or something. And so we printed eggs that were round and eggs that were increasingly angular and asked at what point were they too pointy for a robin to accept. And so this bird actually accepted this little pointy egg and incubated it as if it was her own. Um, but you can imagine as they get more and more spiky, the robins are not, not going to think they're an egg anymore. So those are the kind of experiments you can do to ask, you know, using this fake egg, you can ask questions about the behavior of the birds that are parasitized. It's a little hard to test mafia, which is why we often refer to this as the mafia hypothesis, because we don't have a lot of conclusive evidence that it's happening. It would be amazing if you could put like a tiny little video camera on a female cowbird and see if she's coming back to the nest and see if she's checking back in on her babies. Um, but they just don't make batteries small enough yet to make cameras that small. Um, so we can't put cameras on birds, on little birds yet. Um, someday I'm sure we'll be able to. But you can put cameras at nests. Um, so here's a video that I took again. Here's a grasshopper sparrow nest buried in the grass. Um, and a female cowbird is going to come into this nest, and she's going to take out these babies. Um, so I'm going to play it. Don't watch it if you don't want to see baby birds die. Um, there's no blood or anything. She just pulls them out of the nest. I'm going to play it now. Um, so in she comes. The little yellow-beaked one is a grasshopper sparrow. The little white-beaked one is actually another cowbird baby. But this female cowbird comes in, and she just tears those babies out of the nest. She dumps them out into the prairie where the family can't find them anymore. Those babies are doomed. Um, but you can see from when she removes this little, this last little blurry grasshopper sparrow baby, there's actually something else in the nest, and that's a cowbird egg. So if you think through this mafia hypothesis, maybe this bird is retaliating because the sparrows didn't take good enough care of her egg. Maybe that egg was hers. It didn't hatch. She is acting like a mafioso at this point, coming in and reinforcing this parasitism behavior. And so what we could do as researchers is take that egg, look at the genetic material inside of it, catch that female, look at her genetic material, see for sure if they're related, and then just repeat that thousands of times until we have enough data to test that hypothesis. <laughs> so as you can imagine, there's not a lot of conclusive evidence of that yet because it takes a lot of work. Um, and of all the videos, as I mentioned, I had like eight months of continuous footage, and I had three instances of a, a female cowbird coming and killing nestlings. Um, so you'd have to do a very large study to, to catch this mafia behavior at work doing it this way. Um, and so yeah, we have this observation that these sparrows um, are raising these cowbirds. I've researched the topic area. We built some good hypotheses together. 
I've come up with some quick experiments you could do to test each hypothesis. And then if we would do that and we'd have all that funding and, and time and money, you know, we could analyze those data and report those conclusions. And ultimately, that is the scientific method. Um, I just want to give a quick plug. I know I'm, I'm running out of time, but I just want to talk about how important the scientific method is and kind of step away from birds for a second. And you might have seen articles like this, especially in the past year, but here they're reporting that the CDC is changing its course on indoor masks in some parts of the U.S. And there's been a lot of criticism of the CDC and the, the scientists that run the Center of Disease Control. You know, why do they keep saying one thing for the coronavirus pandemic and then changing it to something else? Um, why, why can't they just tell us how to be safe um, so we can all get it in our heads and you know, live our lives as safely as possible. But it's because they're doing the scientific method over and over. They're taking data, they're making hypotheses, they're analyzing those data, they're making a conclusion, they're announcing it to the public, and then that cycle repeats itself again, where they suddenly have new data on how their, you know, recommendations are working, and this cycle repeats over and over and over. Um, and it's something that, as a scientist, I'm really used to. Um, you go to conferences every year, you get new updates on new things. Every time you go, you learn facts about even common species that I thought I knew everything about. Um, but it's because people keep asking questions, keep, you know, looking for new data. Um, so it's interesting to see that translated to the real world, where now people who aren't used to this kind of cyclical nature of the scientific method are faced with it for the first time and are struck by this idea that, you know, like the CDC doesn't know what they're doing because they keep changing the recommendations. And they're like, no, this is how science is supposed to work. Um, it's just frustrating. <laughs> um, and I know that all too well. We also see it when you see headlines like this where it's like, the USA Today headline that says, go ahead, have a third cup of coffee. You might just live longer, um, which, yeah, as a coffee drinker, I'm totally down with. But these often, um, I don't, my mom's not here, so I can sort of trash talk her, but she will find a headline like this, and she'll be like, okay, coffee forever. And then another study will come out and say, coffee is bad for you. And she'll just be perplexed, where it's like, you know, why have scientists changed their mind? It's like, no, they've just pursued a question in different ways. They have new conclusions. One research said, you know, study, this single study about the third cup of coffee ultimately isn't going to give you the full picture of how coffee affects people. It's an ongoing process. But when we report science, we often report it, each individual study, as if it's the ultimate solution to the problem. Um, which as a scientist just really frustrates me because it's, that's not how it works. Um, finally, we often talk a lot about scientific theories versus hypotheses. So here's a little joke. It says like a scientific theory or theorem is something that is considered proven. The colloquially used word theory actually refers to a scientific hypothesis. So when we talk just in everyday common stuff, we say like, I have a theory about something. What we mean is a really educated guess based on an observation, that's a hypothesis in scientific language. When we talk about a scientific theory, it means something that has an idea that's gone through the scientific process over and over and over and over until we finally find the conclusion. Um, something like that third cup of coffee study, that's not a theory. We don't have enough data yet about coffee to come up with a theory of coffee. But when we say something like the theory of gravity or the theory of evolution, it's because we have so many studies that prove it. Ultimately, we, we elevate it beyond the level of a hypothesis. So I think um, understanding the way that science works kind of behind the scenes as we, we do the scientific method to ultimately try to get conclusions that we test over and over, it can kind of inform the ways that we, we think about things like the CDC or scientific reports in USA Today, or even how we talk about theories when we, we talk about gravity or evolution or something like that. Um, so that's my plug for understanding the nature of the scientific method. Um, so here's my contact info again. I am more than happy to chat about cowbirds and anything that you would like to chat about. I actually ended early for once, which is unusual for me. Um, so we can, I have all sorts of more fun cowbird facts I can share with you all if you have any questions. Um.
Well, first, I'm just going to chime in and say thank you so much. And I love that last slide, not this one, but the last one regarding the scientific method, you know, the CDC, and things that are real today that you're looking at. And, you know, the media plays a big part of this, too. They pick out the little things and, like, throw it up in the, in the, on the news or in the paper or on the radio, and you're like, oh, hey, how about that? So blame the media, too. Um, yeah, I am, yeah. I'm going to ask a question regarding cowbirds. Mm -hmm. um, how do cowbirds find each other in the spring, males and females, when they're raised by different species? Like a male cowbird might be raised by a cardinal, a female might be raised by a song sparrow. All right, they don't learn the song of that host species. So how does a cowbird know what another cowbird looks like or should sound like? And I've, always thought about, I've always thought about that. Yeah, so this is an excellent story. Um, and actually, the person who ended up discovering this is the man that I work for now, Dr. Halbert. Um, so he, he was asking this question, how does a cowbird ultimately learn it's a cowbird? Why doesn't it just think it's a grasshopper sparrow? Um, and we know most birds actually learn their song. So like a baby grasshopper sparrow just listens to male grasshopper sparrows and learns its song. And so if it's not around those sparrows, it will never learn the right song. It'll sing really wonky. It'll never find a mate. It'll be really sad. Um, so ultimately, that can't happen for cowbirds, right? They can't learn their song from their parents because otherwise they'd learn a sparrow song. So we knew from other past research that cowbirds, if you just like take them out of the wild and you raise them on their own, they will ultimately sing a cowbird song. So that's the first bit. They, they just know in their genes how to sing a song, which is fascinating because that's not how most birds work, which is really neat. But that doesn't really explain how they ultimately know that they're a cowbird and how they learn to associate with other cowbirds. And there's some evidence that they start associating with other cowbirds really early, like before they even leave the nest, like permanently. They'll actually sneak out in the middle of the night and like hang out with cowbirds outside of their nest, <laughs> um, which is wild. We just caught that because we started putting these cameras on birds. I've never seen it in my system, but cavity nesting birds, they'll like leave the cavity and they'll just come back hours later. And so researchers have put little like tracking backpacks on the babies and like, where are you going? And they do, they go out and they like hang out with other cowbirds and then they come back to their nest. Um, which is wild. How do they know how to do that to start with is a whole nother question. Um, just so many more questions. But what Dr. Halbert ultimately found is that female cowbirds give a call, a particular note that they make. We call it their chatter call because um, it just sounds like kind of babbling, like a chattering. And that chatter call, when a baby cowbird hears it, it unlocks their cowbird identity in their brain. So the second they hear that song, they go from thinking they're a baby sparrow to thinking that they're a baby cowbird. And it unlocks all of these processes, like their song and things like that, that make them uniquely cowbirds. And they've actually studied this like with cowbird brains. And so they know exactly what protein is activated in the brain when they hear this chatter call. Um, so without if, for instance, you take a cowbird egg and you place it somewhere where there are no adult cowbirds, so that that baby will never hear a chatter call, it will never learn it's a cowbird. Um, so yeah, it's a fascinating <laughs> puzzle of like, how, how do these birds manage to become cowbirds when they're raised by sparrows? And it's because of this special call that the females give that unlocks their identity. That's amazing. I am, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's, that's crazy. Uh, I think it's so cool, which is why I work for, for Dr. Haber now. Yeah. <laughs> Quite inspired by that research. Are there any other questions about cowbirds or science or what it's like to be a scientist or what it's like being stuck in mm -hmm. Illinois and not getting to experience warbler migration in the east, you know? Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's starting here. Yeah, I've had a few. I had four species this weekend, um, but it's not the same as like McGee Marsh or something. Right. And no yeah, you can certainly, 
if you have more questions, feel free to shoot me an email. There's a contact form on my website. It's just www.sarahonicki.com. Twitter, however you want to reach me. I think this was absolutely fascinating, and I thank you so much for for your time, your talents, and keep up the good work. I, I you know, just working with the school groups and you know, nature centers and wherever else you can get the word out and just get that science out there because <laughs> we, yeah. <laughs> we need it. Yeah. And if you want to learn more about my science in particular, all of my papers are up on my website, and there's links to other talks that I give, like talks that are all about biology of cowbirds and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So that it's all available on that sarahwinicki.com. Fantastic. All righty. Well, we'll let you go. And uh, again, all the folks from Western Cuyahoga, friend, uh, our members and guests, thank you so much for being here this evening. And we are really appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. Good night, everyone.